Hi, need a ride? Hop on in. I'm headed to Julia's Trucking Cafe. Come on, let's go. We made it just in time. Come on, let's go get a seat. Hey everybody, welcome to Julia's Truckin' Cafe. Everybody have a seat and get something to drink. Y'all looking good. We got a good crowd in here this evening. Thank you so much for showing up. I greatly appreciate it. Now just sit back and enjoy the show. As always, I have lots of news to get to. In the news, it's been found out since the ELD mandate that was intended to increase highway safety, new crash data shows that the fatal in truck-involved crashes are on the rise. New data from the federal transportation officials indicate that fatal crashes involving commercial vehicles increased in the first year after the ELD mandate went into effect. Even though traffic fatalities in general went down. According to a summary of crash data released by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration or NHTSA this month in June of 2019, the number of fatalities caused by all traffic crashes decreased from 37,133 in 2017 to 36,750 in 2018. That's a decrease of 1%. However, they, the data that they collected shows that the number of fatalities involving at least one, quote, large truck, end quote, rose by 3% in 2018. This would indicate that the first full year that the ELDs were in effect, fatalities caused by crashes involving commercial vehicles increased significantly. It is important to note that the NHTSA data does not indicate that the truck driver was at fault in those fatal crashes, only that a semi-truck and truck driver were involved. As of December 18, 2017, most truck drivers were required by FMCSA regulations to switch from paper logs over to electronic logging devices or ELDs. Authorities argue that the device could cut down on truck driver hours of service violations and increase highway safety. The NHSTA states that their stats come from early estimates and that they are still working to compile crash data for 2018. Now in other news, a fire trucker's fiance shoots at multiple people at a truck stop. A Louisiana woman is facing attempted homicide charges after she allegedly opened fire at several people at a truck stop on Friday, June 21st. This happened around 2.30 in the afternoon on Friday at the TA in Slidell, Louisiana. I know that place really well. Police say and it's, it's gone down over the years, trust me. People say that they received multiple calls about a woman shooting a gun in the truck stop parking lot. When officers arrived on the scene, three people said that 32-year-old Natalie Williams had tried to kill them after her fiancé was fired from his trucking job for poor performance. This is a quote from the Slidell Police Department. One of the victims, who is the owner of a trucking company, confronted Williams and her fiancé outside of a semi in the back parking lot of the TA. The owner of the trucking company decided to fire Williams' fiancé for poor job performance and evict them from the semi. 
An argument ensued, at which time Williams retrieved the gun and began firing several rounds at the owner of the truck and company. Williams then pointed the gun at the victim's truck and fired several more rounds inside the cab of the truck. Inside of the truck were the victim's fiance and their one-year-old son. Miraculously, no one was struck by the bullets. Police were able to find Williams, who was hiding in the nearby woods, and arrest her without a problem. She has since been charged with attempted first-degree murder. Well, good for them. Louisiana Popo finally does something right, you know what? So now, in this next series of stories, you all have been hearing, if you haven't, about a really bad wreck in New Hampshire that happened last week. And a young man who happens to be from Ukraine, a foreign national that is here, was driving a pickup truck and a gooseneck trailer from accounts and crashed into a group of 10 motorcycle riders who was traveling down a two-lane road in the opposite direction. Um, He now has pled not guilty, of course. You know, that's just pretty much in the criminal law. That's just normal. This happened Concord, New Hampshire. A driver for a transport company who has a history of traffic arrest pled not guilty just yesterday, Tuesday, to seven counts of negligent homicide in a collision with a group of motorcyclists on a rural highway. Vladimir Zukovsky, 23, was ordered to remain in preventive detention with a judge saying his driving record poses a potential danger to the public and himself. In the plea, the plea was entered by Zukovsky's attorney, Melissa Davis, in Coos County Court in Lancaster, New Hampshire. Zukovsky remains behind bars there. Davis didn't immediately return calls seeking comment. Of course not. The Dodge pickup truck Zukovsky was driving was towing a flatbed trailer and collided with the motorcycles at Randor, Randolph early Friday evening, police say. He was driving erratically and crossing the center line, according to criminal complaints released on Tuesday. A survivor of the crash of the trailer trailer wiped out most of the bikers that were behind him, which was the Jarheads Motorcycle Club, which were Marine veterans, and they were going to Blessing of the Bikes, which happens each year, Um, a ceremony that bikers go to to have their bikes blessed for a safe riding season. And this per the um, president of this Jarheads Club witnessed his fellow bikers get mowed down by this gooseneck trailer. Connecticut prosecutors say that Zukowski was arrested at, back in May 11th at Walmart parking lot in East Windsor, Walmart, after failing a sobriety test. Zukowski's lawyer in that case, John O'Brien, said he denies being intoxicated and he's going to fight that charge. No, because he, you'll, you'll hear further what's really going on. Additionally, Zukovsky was arrested on a drunken driving charge in 2013 in Westfield, Massachusetts, state records show. Oh, and before I forget, did I tell you he's only 23? He was placed on probation for one year and his license suspended for 210 days. Zukovsky's father, who just happens to go by the same name, told the Boston Herald that his son is a Ukrainian national and has a permanent resident status in the U.S. The younger Zukovsky's court, court file excuse me, includes a letter dated Sunday from a deportation officer from Immigration and Customs Enforcement requesting details on his 2017 heroin and cocaine convictions. Records from the FMCSA indicate that the company he was working for at the time of the crash has been cited for various violations in the past two years. Phones rang unanswered at the company. Of course they did. Their lawyer is going to say, don't answer, don't take, make no comments to the press. They always do. The owner has previously said he was cooperating with the investigation. The crash ma- victims were members or supporters of the Marine Jarheads, a New England motorcycle club that includes Marines and their spouses in an age range from 42 to 62. Four were from New Hampshire, two from Massachusetts, and one from Rhode Island. Jarhead president, this Manny Ribirio, Ribirio, 
sorry if I, uh, if you're listening, sorry I butchered your name, who survived the crash said he just remembers an explosion and the trailer from the truck whipping or whipping out. Oh, excuse me, my bad. Let me try it again. He just remembers an explosion and the trailer from the truck wiping out most of the bikers behind him. The crash would not have been so deadly, he said, if not for the trailer. After the crash, Ribeiro recalled seeing Zukowski, quote, screaming and running around, end quote, in the road before authorities arrived and took him away. And then they also identified the Marines that passed. Now, another story related to this one. He was also accused of flipping a semi-truck weeks ago. The head of the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles, like the DMV in every other state, has resigned after failing to terminate this young man's CDL following an operating while under intoxication charge back in May. In the wake of a tragic crash that claimed the lives of the seven motorcyclists in New Hampshire last week, new details are emerging about the driving record of this young man accused of causing this crash. Following that crash, the authorities started to dive deeper into Westfield Transport and Zukowski's driving history. Here are some facts that have come to light. Um, He received his personal driving license in... April of 2013, then received his Class A CDL on August 3rd, 2018, about five years later. Mass DOT says Zukowski's driving record includes a violation on June 26th, 2013, for operating while intoxicated liquor and a disposition for that violation following his participation in a youth alcohol program. Apparently it didn't do a lot of good. I mean, not even two months after he got his license, he was already drunk behind the wheel. Zukowski was arrested for possession of drug paraphernalia in February of this year, 2019, when police discovered a crack pipe on him while he was, quote, talking to himself and acting strange, end quote, at a Denny's restaurant in Texas. Zukowski was arrested for operating under the influence of again on May 11, 2019 in Connecticut after police were called to a Walmart parking lot of reports of someone revving a truck engine and jumping around in the lot. The Boston Herald reports that police were so disturbed by Zukowski's suicidal comments and erratic behavior that they sent him to the hospital. Zukowski also reportedly refused to take a drug test during that May 11th incident. Now why? To cover his ass. Baytown, Texas. Police say that Zukowski flipped an 18-wheeler about 20 miles east of Houston on June 3rd, 2019. That was just three weeks before this incident. Two weeks. Zukowski told police that he crashed after a car cut him off. And then he was incited, and no injuries were reported. Investigators also say that Westfield transport drivers are placed out of service four times more often than the average trucking company. 28.8% versus 5.5%. And depending upon what the outcome of this case is, he very well could be deported back to Ukraine, which is... As far as I'm concerned, he really needs to be after the death penalty. But that's just me. So now you are all caught up on what is going on with this 23-year-old Ukrainian. So, in other news, Wisconsin State Patrol parked on the side shoulder of the road, like they love to do, got hit by a semi-truck. And he wonders why. The Wisconsin Department of Transportation shared dash cam video of a semi-truck striking a state police cruiser that was parked along I-94 this week. Um, hello, isn't 94 pretty goddamn busy right around Madison? Not Madison, my bad, Milwaukee. Too many M's in that state. The crash happened around 9 o'clock on Monday, June 24th near Cottage Grove, Wisconsin. That's 94 going back to 39. Video shared by transportation officials show a semi-truck swerving outside of its lane toward the shoulder of I-94 and striking the cruiser. Fortunately, the cop wasn't hurt. 
Department of Transportation calls the incident, quote, a vivid reminder of the hazards faced by law enforcement and other roadside workers. In other words, dumbass, get your shit off the shoulder of the road. Okay, I'm sorry. Now, in sad news, I do want to, before I get to that, this episode of Julia's Truck and Cafe radio show podcast is brought to you by My Patriot Supply. You know, as truck drivers, we all know what it's like to be at a shipper's or receiver's and have to wait to be loaded for hours on end. Am I right? Now, for example, this week, I'm sitting where? At Coca-Cola in Minnesota, in Egan, Minnesota. I got here early. I got unloaded on the west side of Minneapolis, St. Paul. I... It was like 6.30 this morning. I'm empty. So I booked on over here to Egan because it never said it was Coca-Cola. The broker put on their GLCCC, which is Great Lakes Coca-Cola Company. And I thought I would have known that. So here I sit, been here since 6.30 this morning. At the time of this recording, it's 3.30 Central Time in the afternoon. Luckily, I had food in my truck. So this is a prime example why you need to stock up your sleeper. Or, I'm sure, I'm not the sleeper, but under the bunk, you know what I mean. Your side box with supplies from My Patriot Supply. Because all you need to do is add water to it. Now, you know, it's not what you're thinking. It's emergency food. And it comes in a foil pouch that stay fresh pouch with a ziploc to it and they have food kits their food kits are good up to 25 years they also are packed in a slim line tote that'll slide right into your side box and you could easily or you could easily store it home in your food pantry and just take a few out at a time that you need besides parking here and waiting on coca-cola to get me loaded i also lived through hurricane katrina in my mobile home We were without power for 10 days, my mother, my son, and I. And if it weren't for the MREs that were flown into us, we wouldn't have had any food. There was four 60-foot pine trees that broke in half during that storm and landed across my driveway, landlocked us in, and I couldn't get out to go get food. There were four-mile gas lines as well. If I knew then what I know now, about my Patriot Supply, I would have definitely been stocked up and had some of that in my pantry that I wouldn't have had to worry about food. Because they were giving away gallons and gallons and gallons of water and bags and bags and bags of ice, making sure everybody was plenty hydrated and had enough ice. For a limited time, you could get a one-week food supply kit in a handy and neat-looking ammo can for just $39. And... Not only that, they even have gluten-free food. They have beef. They have fruits and vegetables. Just go to my website at juliastruckandcafe.com. Click on the emergency food supply. Scroll down. Tap on any of the images to find out more information about it. What it actually contains. What the cost is because everything's a little bit different. You don't have to get a whole ton of them at once. You know, just you could get one tote and it just a variety. They have tons of things to choose from. So you need, everybody needs to stay prepared for anything that happens. Like I said, I'm waiting on Coke. Now I'm in the middle of my eight hour break. I still have a couple hours to go. I figured I'd record this show finally this week. There again, sorry it's coming out late. But, you know, that My Patriot Supply would have came in pretty doggone handy. Back to the news. Now, there was a fatal crash last week in Wisconsin on Interstate 41 and 94, just outside of Racine, which is in southern Wisconsin, right south of Milwaukee. The Racine County Medical Examiner's Office confirms that two people died, and the county sheriff said those killed were both semi-drivers. According to WITI, officials anticipate they will be able to open the interstate again around 8 p.m. That was on Wednesday. From what I understand, that three northbound vehicles hit each other, uh, or excuse me, the sheriff's investigation shows a semi-truck tractor trailer, I don't know why they call it that, it's just a semi, was traveling southbound when the driver made a lane change and in that process 
uh, came too close to the concrete barrier and he overcorrected and hit the median wall. That He hit it so hard that he shoved it into the northbound lanes of 94. Three northbound vehicles hit each other and or the barrier in their path. And the driver of a northbound semi, so he wouldn't run into the car that hit everything in front of him, made evasive maneuver and he drove off the road to which his semi, he went up and over the wall, drove all over the road, crash landed, looks like upside down, and the his semi burst into flames. And of course he didn't make it. So he took his own life, which should be a lesson for all of us. If something like this happens, can you honestly ask yourself, what would I do? Would I take my own life? Instead of killing somebody else. A lot of these new drivers I'm talking to out here now, they wouldn't. They would run the person over in front of them instead of taking their own life. So you have to ask yourself, what would you do? And I'll go into more of that, in my opinion, at the end of the show. So stay tuned for that. In other news, a suspect is now in custody after he started shooting up the place in Kansas City in the caves, what's also known as Subtropolis. Kansas City police say that they've arrested an armed, disgruntled former employee following a standoff in a large underground business complex. On Tuesday, June 25th, just yesterday, police were called to the Subtropolis underground complex, often we refer to it as the caves, in northeastern Kansas City, Missouri. Police say that a terminated employee had made threats to, quote, shoot the place up, end quote, resulting in a standoff and lockdown as police searched the massive underground structure. Can I talk today? Multiple local and federal agencies responded to the scene. Well, yeah, that's a that's a hellacious threat. As of 1130 that morning, Kansas City police department announced that the suspect was in custody and that the lockdown on the facility was lifted. So if you're new to the show and if you're not a truck driver, thank you for joining us. Um, But let me explain what Subtropolis actually is. One second. Subtropolis is a underground cave, artificial cave system that was built It was created through the mining of 270 million year old limestone deposit in Missouri. In the mining process, limestone is removed by the room and pillar method, leaving 25 foot square pillars that are on 65 foot centers and 40 feet apart. The pillars even spacing Concrete flooring and 16 foot high smooth ceilings make build to suit facilities time and cost efficient for tenants. A tenant requiring 10,000 to 1 million square feet can be in their space within 150 days. Subtopal is completely dry, brightly lit, with miles of wide paved streets and accessed at street level. Um, The foreign foreign trade zone is in there. There's a lot of it. It stays at a constant temperature of, I believe, 40 degrees. And it's served by over 300 truck lines and rail. So I'm pretty sure it stays at over, uh, it's over 6 million square feet. uh, More than 8 million square feet for expansion. 8.2 miles of lighted wide paved roads. 2.1 2.1 miles of railroad track, uh, more than 500 truck dock locations, 17 foot high ceilings, um, more than 2,000 employees, more than 1,600 parking spaces, over 10,000 limestone pillars. It's protected by its own sprinkler system, and its strength in, strength of limestone is 18,000 to 24,000 pounds per square inch. And it's stronger than concrete. So there you go. If you haven't didn't know about Subtropolis, I have delivered there to the caves. And not only temperature-wise is it cool, but it's, it's a cool place to go see if you haven't seen it at all and you're out here driving a truck. So, And you, you have to be very careful when you go in there. 
that you won't skin anything up because going around the pillars and stuff like that is very easy to skin up your your truck and the sides of your trailer etc and uh, let's get back to the news a speeding suv driver causes a crash that kills a trucker and then leaves the scene the police say that an suv driver got a ride away from the crash with another motorist california police are on the hunt it always happens in california they're on the hunt for a reckless suv driver who say they caused a crash and cost a semi truck driver his life last week the crash occurred around 8.30 on Thursday, June 20th in Moreno Valley, California. Police say that a male truck driver in a black, or excuse me, let me start again. Police say that a male driver in a black 2004 Chevy Tahoe was speeding and weaving in and out of lanes on northbound I-215 near Cactus Avenue. As the SUV driver approached slower traffic, police say he veered to the right, colliding with a semi-truck driven by 36-year-old Robert Ferguson. Ferguson's truck rolled as a result of the collision, and Ferguson was later pronounced dead at the scene. The California Highway Patrol says after the crash, the SUV driver fled the scene. The driver is believed to have received the ride from another motorist. Ferguson was an Army veteran and a father of three. Our condolences go out to the Ferguson family. If you saw the crash or have any information on the identity of the Tahoe driver and you're listening to this show, you could call California Highway Patrol Riverside office at 951-637-8000. That's 951-637-8000. Thousand. Again, this accident happened on Thursday, June 20th, Moreno Valley, California, on I-215 near Cactus Avenue on the northbound side. Now, FMCSA wants to remind us and truckers and trucking companies that using AO boards or automatic onboard logging devices the compliance date is just a few months away ah uh, pretty much six the dot is warning drivers using a grandfathered hours of service recording device that they're running out of time to make the switch to an approved eld the fmcsa is reminding truck drivers who are using an automatic onboard recording device or aobrd that they have only a few months left to make the switch over to an approved ELD. They rem of course, they reminded everybody on Facebook. What if you don't get on Facebook? They're saying by December 16, 2019, all motor carriers presently using an automatic onboard recording device must switch over to an electronic logging device that's registered with them, the FMCSA. You can see the list of ELDs self-certified by the manufacturer at there's a link in this article eld.fmcsa.dot.gov backslash list or forward slash my bad forward slash list a slash list if the device you are consider considering is not on the list it's not an ELD when ELD enforcement went into effect on December 18 2017 the FMCSA allowed motor carriers who are already using AO BRDs to continue to do so for the next two years. Damn, it's been two years already? Really? The chart below from the Indiana State Police quickly outlines the differences between ELDs and AOBRDs. And that would be, pull it up here, I'll tell you real quickly what the differences are. Uh, first I'm going to list the AOBRD and then next will be the ELD. Okay, so the AOBRD, what it records is date and time, engine hours, vehicle miles, drive times, location, duty status. Now what the ELD records, it records the date and time, engine hours, vehicle miles, locations, identifying information on driver or user, comma, motor carrier, and vehicle including duty status, logging in and out, engine on and off, and malfunctions. The locations on the AOBRD recorded during each change of duty status can be entered manually. Locations on an ELD is automatically recorded. 
when a change of duty status, 60 minute intervals while driving, when the engine is turned on or off, and at the start and end of yard moves and personal conveyance. The accuracy within one mile when on duty driving, within 10 miles when in personal conveyance of the location. Now the edit history, this may be important to a lot of us. Records who made an, excuse me, who records who made an, I just can't talk today. Records who made an edit and when does not readily display edit history. Now that is in the AOBRD. In the ELD, it records who made an edit and when. All edits require an annotation. Automatically recorded events cannot be changed, only annotated. Readily displays edit history to DOT inspectors. The driving time. Driving time can only be edited when attributed to the wrong driver. In the ELD, driving time cannot be edited period. So not even somebody at your office can edit the driving time on that. So that's all I have for the news. Now for my editorial and what I wanted to speak about was several of the topics in the news this week. Mainly speeding through construction zones and also, oh before I get forget to that, I have one more um, article that I almost neglected to talk about. So before I get to that, the last article was a truck tr- trucker crashed because she, quote, couldn't decide which ramp to take and ran out of time. The Arkansas Department of Transportation blamed a semi-truck crash and a resulting fireball on the truck driver's confusion about her route. This happened on the afternoon of Sunday, June 23rd, just outside of Little Rock, Arkansas. Authorities say that a mail truck struck a guardrail on a bridge over I-440 because the driver, quote, couldn't decide which ramp to take and ran out of time before making the decision. The collision caused the cab of the truck to separate from the trailer. Authorities also said that one of the fuel tanks fell off of the truck and dropped down onto I-30, causing a fireball, and the other tank leaked fuel. The truck driver was taken to the hospital for treatment of unknown injuries. The incident resulted in heavy traffic delays on I-440 and I-30 yesterday. The crash is still under investigation. Now for my opinion piece. Sorry about that. But there again, what I want to talk about is speeding through construction zones and trip planning. We all know that everybody's in a freaking hurry. And... You don't want to listen to the rest, to my opinion on this. I mean, you can exit out. That's fine. I completely understand. I wish you would, though. Um, I have been doing this 30 years, and so I I do have a little bit of experience at this. So many people are in a freaking hurry anymore. Foot to the floor, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, as a friend of mine would say. And there, it's no call for it, especially in construction zones, like Uh, You heard me talk about this gentleman that tried to go from the right lane to the left lane and hit the median. It must have, you know, those concrete barriers are heavy and he pushed it. He hit it so hard that he pushed it out into the northbound lanes. Really? (coughs) And then caused several people to crash into it that were going north and weren't expecting it. And then a truck driver had to take his life because of the fact that he didn't want to run over the person in front of him? All because you were going too goddamn fast and you lost control? What is it going to take? How many people have to die, people, before you slow the F down? Answer that question. How many people are you going to kill? How many people are going to die? Your mom? Your sister? Your grandma? Your aunt? Who are you going to kill next if you don't slow the F down? I really want everybody to think about that. How many people have to die? Now, trip planning. If you're a new driver out here or an old hand, there's a lot of times I get in a hurry and I forget to trip plan, you know, but I do the best I can. I pretty much don't need a GPS or Atlas anymore because I know all the interstates. It's just in the city that I use it to help me get where I'm going, you know, 
And uh, but you still have to trip plan. You have, you know, if you have to write notes down, if you have to do a voice memo, if you have to get a, a marker. Someone told me years ago, get a dry erase marker. I don't know. I'll have to test it out on a window, you know, see if it works. But I mean, you always could get it. Not really a grease pencil. That really that'll be held to come off a glass. But I think a dry erase marker. You write it across the very top of the windshield. You know, I-30 to I-440 to, you know, 40 west or east, whatever way you're going. When you're coming, especially coming out of Dallas, yeah, that gets really confusing. Look, buy yourself a road atlas, a trucker's road atlas. Get one every single year. I know somebody that has a 2005 road atlas. I won't mention any names. <clears throat> but anyway, you know, don't... In Damn sure, damn sure, don't depend on Google Maps. Google Maps is only for cars. They don't know the truck routes. They don't know where the low bridges are. They don't know, you know, that there's tunnels or anything else coming up ahead that you need to know as a driver. So, ixnay on the Google Maps. Get yourself, I prefer a Rand McNally. There's Garmin, there's Rand McNally. You could go to my website and... I sell it right there under the cafe store electronics. Get yourself a dog on GPS. I don't want, you know, the money. I'm just trying to provide y'all a service. I pr try to provide everybody a service, try to knock a little bit of sense in y'all's heads. Doing this, I'm so sick of getting run over out here because everybody's got to be hammered down. Get the F out of my way. Get the, I gotta go. Get the hell out of my way. Gotta go. That's, it's crap. It's a load of crap. How many, you know, like I said before, how many have to die before people are gonna wake up and slow the hell down? What, what do we have to do? Putting trucks at 65 miles an hour isn't the answer. Getting Ukrainians, you know, I should say, but he's from Ukraine, troublemakers, why? How come they didn't do a background check on him when they gave him his CDL? You know, five months after getting his license, they already got a operating while intoxicated charge, and then you give him a CDL? Really? You're just waiting, asking for a fucking accident. What is it going to take, people? We can change this, but we have to be united doing it. What is it going to take? How many more people are going to have to die? Think about that. Now, in closing, I greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate all of you who tune in every week to listen to me banter here on the cafe. I started the cafe with it being like a virtual cafe to bring back the old days where us drivers used to think about each other out here, have common courtesy, common decency, sit down and talk together and, and discuss the topics of what's going on out in the industry. I want to bring those days back because they weren't so bad. They really weren't so bad. So that's why I call this the cafe. Come on into the cafe. Let's sit down and talk trucking. But anyway, so if you're new, that's my explanation of why I call it the cafe. And if you'd like to check us out someplace else other than having to go to the website, at the bottom of every podcast episode on our website at juliastruckatcafe.com, under the cafe menu, and then you click on shows, there are links that I have listed where you could find me on iHeartRadio. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel or Apple Podcasts and many more. Spotify, Spreaker, SoundCloud. I also have a page, Where Else to Find Me, that has everything listed. Just click and it'll take you right there. Don't forget, like us on Facebook. If you are on Facebook, and it would be great if you join our discussion group at Julia's Truck and Cafe Regulars. I do go through, and I will tell you, if you ask to be admitted to the Cafe Regulars discussion group, I do look at your Facebook page. I do look and see, are you a truck driver? You don't necessarily have to be, but what kind of stuff are you posting? I want positive people in the regulars. If you're doing nothing but cussing and swearing and putting a bunch of crap on Facebook, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to admit you. I don't want that kind of people in the discussion group. I, it's a learning discussion group for newbie drivers that want to learn something and that us old timers can teach. 
That's what this discussion group is about. I don't want nasty stuff on there, half-naked people, cussing and swearing and all that kind of stuff. That's not what our discussion group is about. So if you're that type of person, don't even bother sending a request. I'm sorry, you're not going to get accepted. I'm trying to keep it clean. This is a family-friendly show. Uh, I apologize to anybody if I offend anybody, but, you know, it's my show. I share recipes on our website along with cooking videos and a page of stupid shit that drivers do. I also ask that you join our email list and I send you the articles right into your inbox. If you like the show and you like what I do in the description of every show and you want to become a sponsor, I have a link on how you could do that. In the description of every show under cafe menu and shows just click on this show and scroll down underneath the audio player you'll see a description of what I'm talking about and there'll be a link to patreon so if you like the show you like what I hear you would like to support me it does cost me quite a bit of money every month besides my time to pr- produce and promote this show at an end note I just want to tell everybody that if, if you want to email me, my email is info at juliestruckatcafe.com. That's I-N-F-O at juliestruckatcafe.com. Um, I want to let everybody know that I'm a one-person show here. I research, I record, I produce, I upload it to the website. I built the website. I promote it to social media. iTunes and everything is pretty much automatic. There's a couple other places. YouTube, I have to do it manually. Plus, I drive 70 hours a week. So, this is a one-person show. It does cost quite a bit for me to put this on every week. So, it would be great if you'd like to become a sponsor. You would get kudos. Just a first name, what have you. That, hey, you know, we got a new sponsor. Great. You know, thank you so much. You're, uh, you know, I'd be indebted to you if you would sponsor the, the show. You know, three to five dollars. It's just a month. You can, you know, I could put some other variables up there too. But that would be great. I'm not asking for a whole lot. And in the future, I'll have a PayPal if you want to just do a one-time donation. But that it would be excellent. You know, I'm not begging. I'm just saying if that's, if you'd like to sponsor something like that, I would greatly appreciate it. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you again for tuning in this week. Thank you for listening to my rant. But there was a lot of poor, important issues this week that I really wanted to address and I really wanted to talk about. So thank you again for listening each and every week. And keep the shiny side up. Please use your turn signals. Please use your headlights in adverse weather. We're having a lot of heavy-duty rain. Increase following distance. Don't be clipping people when you uh, go past them. Leave enough room when you go past them, please. I'm asking not, as nice as I can. And until next week... We got a little old convoy, rocking through the night. Yeah, we got a little old convoy, ain't she a beautiful sight?